Um, I'm going to start recording now. All righty, and Brandon, if you want to go ahead and take it away. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Rachel, and and uh, thanks to Electrata for partnering with us and uh, on this webinar, and thanks everyone for for attending today. Um, so, just a, a quick uh, introduction uh, of Clean Fuels Ohio. Uh, we are a five hundred one c three nonprofit advocating for uh, clean fuels and and clean transportation technologies throughout the state of Ohio. Uh, and we do that work through programs on federal and state policy, um, uh, member services for industry partners of ours, and consulting services for fleet partners, um, and our Drive Electric Ohio program, which focuses on grassroots outreach and education on EVs uh, with chapters uh, in local communities through, throughout the state. Um, and in addition to being our own standalone nonprofit, uh, we are a um, Clean Cities Coalition under the U.S. Department of Energy Vehicle Technologies Office, um, which means we have access to, uh, you know, all the resources that come with uh, affiliation with the U.S. Department of Energy, as well as uh, collaboration with our Clean Cities Coalition um, uh, counterparts throughout the country. There's about 80 to 90 Clean Cities coalitions throughout the country, and uh, we are the largest one and the, the only one uh, currently in the state of Ohio. Um, and so just, just speaking briefly um, from my position as the consulting services manager, where uh, we work with fleets on analysis and planning projects for the adoption of alternative fuel vehicles, and, and we work with uh, we're a fuel inclusive organization working with all fuel types, um, but of course, with the advancement of uh, the EV market, uh, there's, you know, really increased interest um, from fleets in the adoption of EVs, uh, especially as more models become available throughout the country and in Ohio um, in uh, medium and, and heavy duty applications. Um, you know, municipal and private fleets uh, alike are uh, increasingly interested in trying to adopt EVs and uh, take advantage of, of the growth in, in that market right now. And we're getting a lot of questions and interest in guidance on, you know, how do fleets and, and other site hosts plan for the kind of EV charging infrastructure that they need in order to support the uptick in, in EVs in fleets and in the public at large. Um, and so figuring out what their needs for EV charging, uh, what their needs are, um, as well as how to you know, go and, and seek out solutions providers that can meet those needs through an RFP process um, is something we, we get a lot of questions and interesting guidance on and, and that has prompted uh, us partnering with Electrata on this webinar. Um, and Electrata, as a partner of ours, it occupies a unique position uh, within the EV charging space. Uh, their innovative charging as a service solution um, offers fleets and other site hosts a convenient and cost-effective way to scale up their EV charging network, uh, as well as uh, an easy means of operation and maintenance of, uh, of the charging assets uh, over the course of, of their lifetime. Um, so really happy to, to be working with them uh, to provide uh, the information in this webinar. So with that, I'll, I'll turn things over to David and the Electrata team. Okay, thank you guys. I really, really appreciate that. It's really fun uh, to be with you this morning. And I hope this really is a time for you that's a really informative. I know uh, there's a lot to think about when you think about transitioning uh, your fleet to uh, electric vehicles or uh, in installations with whether multis or residential or public charging or uh, you know, work face, place charging, all that kind of thing. There's a lot to think about. So hopefully this is helpful with you. Obviously we're gonna uh, learn a lot about just even kind of the, the market a bit, the industry, as we think about how uh, to write the RFP as well. So um, yeah, so I'm just going to um, uh, switch over here and just kind of launch right into the presentation. 
if you are, um, you know, if you have questions, I think one of the best ways as, uh, you know, things come in, you can throw your questions in the, in the chat. Uh, I might not see that right away, uh, but then um, we'll definitely have a lot of time at the end. I'm certainly not going to talk for an hour, uh, so um, we'll have a lot of time at the end for questions. I also want to uh, introduce one of my colleagues, uh, Ned Fennell, and he's going to be uh, here as well. So, Ned, you want to come on in? He's going to appear out of the uh, the ether here as well. So, uh, Ned, you want to introduce yourself a little bit here and uh, tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Ned Fennell. I'm manager of technical solutions here at Electrata. I'm a long time uh, EV driver and I've been in the EV uh, world for uh, quite a while, uh, working on everything from uh, charging my own car and my own garage up to uh, heavy duty vehicle charging up to half a megawatt. Uh, I handle all kinds of things having to do with uh, making sure that vehicles get charged reliably and uh, simply. Cool. All right. Thanks, Ned. So he's going to come back during question and answer time. And uh, again, with any uh, technical, more technical questions, vehicle questions um, as well. So, um, so yeah, so just uh, to introduce uh, Electrata again, we handle everything organizations need to power their electric vehicles. Uh, and so basically, you know, we got started <laughs> actually March of 2020. And since then, we've installed uh, hundreds of uh, ports uh, around the kind of tri-state area down here uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And largely, we uh, are really pushing towards helping fleets electrify. And uh, so we basically uh, uh, pay for and install, maintain and upgrade all the uh, electric vehicle infrastructure uh, when a fleet transitions to uh, electric vehicles, while also then giving them um, a fixed price of fuel for uh, like three to five years is our goal for that, uh, so that the, you never have to change the price of of, uh, of of your fuel. So you can plan ahead, uh, and you can know what uh, you know is happening with uh, uh, powering the the actual fuel that powers those electric vehicles. So so that's a little bit about Electrata. So today we are um, gonna. This is what we're gonna go through. We're gonna uh, talk about. Uh, the immediate considerations public entities have uh, when they think about uh, having to power the electric vehicles that they buy. Uh, we're starting to see the uh, F-150 Lightning uh, rollout uh, this month. We're starting to see uh, the e Ford E-Transit rollout. You've got a lot of, of the smaller OEMs uh, uh, with their trucks and their vans. Uh, and uh, and they, of course, they've generated a lot of news. And so a lot of those uh, vehicles are hitting the road. And a lot of the trade shows that, you know, I've been to, uh, a lot of those vans and trucks and things are, are driving. That's not to even mention to some of the, the larger classes of vehicles as well, buses, other uh, trucks and uh, things that are, um, are, you know, they're out on the road. You can ride in them. You can see them. You can, you know, you can experience them. And we're starting to get uh, the specs in as well about that. So, so we're going to look at those con uh, considerations. We're going to talk about charging as a service and what that is um, and how your organization can benefit. Uh, and then we're going to go through some uh, best practices for the RFPs. We're going to uh, uh, outline some of those. We're going to give you some examples of others who have done it uh, and then talk a little bit about kind of where we go from there with question and answer. <clears throat> so the big thing we always want to emphasize is it, it of course it's easy to think that powering an electric vehicle should be <clears throat> just a little bit like uh you know powering a, a gas vehicle and so obviously you just go up to a pump and you put in gas and then off your vehicle goes but when you actually have to plan to charge your uh you power your ev uh there it's it's a lot there's a lot more that goes into it uh than just buying chargers and it really, we will we'll make sure that, you know, our clients, our customers, uh, the people that, you know, uh, we're working with the partners, um, we just don't want them to um, get stuck or feel like it's too complex, it's too costly uh, to, uh, to transition their fleet over to electric vehicles or to provide uh, electric vehicle charging. There's uh, really so much at stake of it, not only just in environmental, but even just, you know, cost wise, you know, right now, um, you know, when you buy an electric vehicle, uh, particularly with fleets is uh, you absolutely should be saving every mile that you drive uh, versus your gas vehicle. So this obviously is a huge opportunity when you think about uh, your, your company, your city, whatever it might be, uh, just uh, to bring down costs. 
uh, uh, particularly in the area of fuel. So this isn't, uh, you don't wanna just uh, treat this as a procurement exercise to buy gear uh, because that is gonna um, put you in a place largely uh, where you're going to have to manage a lot of complexity and, uh, and, and potentially have to deal with a lot of cost overruns uh, with that. So you want to get the, the, the really the, the full landscape of sort of what goes into uh, powering these electric vehicles uh, so that you can get all the benefits of those. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit here about uh, fleets and he, here are the uh, things that we say all the time that usually, um, you know, go into uh, powering an electric fleet vehicle. You'll see there in the dark blue uh, there that we have, uh, you know, largely these are the areas uh, when it comes to the infrastructure itself, right? Um, and you'll see there that you have, you know, from the kind of bottom left there, you've got um, uh, there's financing. You obviously have the project management of how uh, how you actually get the, the the power to the chargers, the chargers at your depot, all of those things, uh, the different charging solutions that exist. One of the big areas, of course, that when you're talking about power and electric vehicles is dealing with utilities. You know, asking the questions, do you have enough power that can come to your depot in order to power your electric vehicles when they need powered? Um, talk about, uh, again, how you optimize your energy costs because, you know, we're used to gas fluctuating, uh, you know, usually uh, weekly, right? Or, you know, every few days, right? The costs of, of gasoline will go up and down. It's obviously there's geopolitical considerations. There's lots of, you know, or even weather that can affect the price of gas and that goes up and down. Electricity can also uh, go up and down uh, and be very volatile too, but it also can be uh, volatile up to uh, even the minute and the hours of a day. So you really want to make sure you under, we un, you understand um, that you're charging at the right times uh, in order to make sure that you're getting the, the best price for the electricity. Um, also then talk about when the power goes out or how you want to use your own power, uh, which then also gets you talking about uh, some of the things like, would you want some uh, on, on-site energy generation like solar, right? So, um, and along with that, of course, then you have, uh, you know, the, how that interacts with the fleet management, um, how that interacts with fleet software solutions, um, and then also the, just the vehicle looks itself. So you have a uh, battery, you have the vehicle financing, and maybe you want to have some upfitting some, and that kind of thing, uh, dealing with the, 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 uh, the actual manufacturers as well. So, um, you know, these are, this will kind of be overwhelming, you know, I think just when you think about all the things that need to go into this, it's, um, and that's really why, you know, companies like Electrata exist, because we, um, obviously, since a lot of people don't have electric fleet vehicles yet, because they're now just rolling off uh, the lines, um, and uh, and then you know basically we we kind of see that complexity coming, and we want to make sure that people don't um, you know get in uh, get into over their heads with it, or start and then get so overwhelmed that the whole initiative uh, just fails. So we uh, we really talk a lot about here. Uh, when we talk about electric vehicles, it's uh, easy to think about the vehicles, but we really want, we really need to emphasize um, the fueling and the energy management. And uh, this is a, a must that we, uh, with any kind of RFP and thinking about um, how, uh, yeah, how you manage the energy now for this new type of fuel. Because if you don't have an energy management plan uh, or someone helping with that, uh, you're going to pay too much for power. Um, like I said, talking about the volatility, how often electricity can change, uh, you know, uh, per hour, per minute, sometimes, um, you know, how it changes throughout the day. One of the things you want to know, too, of course, a lot of your companies or a lot of your cities have uh, put some sustainability goals out there. And obviously, if you don't uh, aren't able to measure this stuff, you're not going to know if you're hitting those goals. Um, obviously, again, too, we're needing to know the amount of power that you would need and how much you need to store of that and even what you could even sell back to the utility. Um, and obviously, 
also too, being able to plan financially uh, is a huge deal. So, um, and then obviously the idea too of what happens in a, in a just a, you know, uh, a rare situation where the power goes out for a while, um, you know, something like what might you know, happen in Texas or, you know, the, obviously the, some of the Southern states that are, you know, more apt to get hit by hurricanes and whatnot. So um, that's why energy management is, is something that needs to be thought through when we think about uh, an RFP. Um, so here's uh, obviously, uh, and we're going to get into a little bit about what uh, charging as a service um, is here. And I think I got to get out of the way a little bit here. Um, and so here's really what, uh, when we think about the considerations you need to be thinking of and where we start, obviously it comes down to budget. And, you know, um, obviously uh, there is a lot of money that's out there now um, from uh, federal government, uh, particularly that is uh, helping fleets transition to electric vehicles or, or money that's out there toward charging infrastructure uh, in your city. Um, and so obviously that is a big part of, um, you know, knowing what it is that, you, uh, you, what money you have to do the project you want to outline. But a lot of it we say, of course, is, uh, you know, how are you particularly using your vehicles right now? And that really is the best place to start. Uh, ownership there is, do you want to own the uh, hardware? Uh, do you, um, and then the hardware, do you know what kind of quality hardware it is? What are some, what are the uptimes for it? What are, are there performance guarantees? Uh, do these chargers uh, talk to one another? Are they able to give data back and forth from the, um, not only to the vehicles, but to your fleet software? Have to figure out how you're going to fix these, um, this hardware when it, uh, when it breaks. And, uh, and then obviously some of the things we other talked about as well. So are you, the on-site power, renewables, uh, your energy management, how much you're driving fleet. These are, these are the things that really uh, come into uh, your immediate considerations for this. So uh, in this slide here, we're, we're just talking a little bit about uh, what charging of a, ser of a service actually is. So when you say that, and you know, um, Obviously, we're probably all very familiar with Amazon Web Services and, you know, back around the turn of the millennium or the turn of the century, you know, companies um, and cities, when they had to get on the Internet, they were basically, uh, you know, they had to buy their own servers and they had to hire people to run those servers. They had the power, they had to cool it. Uh, and that's basically, and that's how, you know, if anything bad happened, their website would go down, but then, you know, Amazon and others came out with web services and said, we will handle everything. Um, then it comes with the hardware and the servers, everything that you need to get, you know, to have a website. And, or, of course, there's way more than websites. Uh, and but you know, we'll handle everything. And then you just pay us, uh, you know, a monthly uh, fee based on on usage. And so uh, and so we got used to that. Right. Where or, or that became a really good thing. And, and really uh, the costs went down, the complexity went down. Um, and so that actually is what is, uh, when we say Electrata and other companies are, are charging as a service, that's what we mean. You know, so we own and operate all of the hardware. We handle all of the, we handle all of the, uh, um, the cost of the infrastructure, the project management, the installation, the engineering, all of that stuff. We deal with the utilities and then you just pay us. Uh, when you use your chargers. And so that is, uh, so that obviously gets into the issue of ownership. Now, what's interesting about this when it comes to RFPs is that, you know, a lot of times RFPs uh, have to happen because uh, when you think about big capital expenses, that will trigger uh, you ha having to do an RFP. Now, what's interesting about charging as a service uh, with somebody like Electrata is, is really uh, since we're the one um, paying for installation, paying for the charger, the maintenance, we're the one um, taking on the risk and we're the owners of it. And then you guys are just are, are plugging in and paying as you use it. Um, it becomes actually, you know, an operations cost and not a capital cost. And there are a lot of organizations that realize that because of a model like this, they uh, don't have to RFP. 
because at all because it it's, uh, comes from the operational budget and uh, not the, the capital budget. So that is, a, uh, I think, one of the things, um, you know, obviously RFPs have a, a really good place. Uh, and, uh, but also we know sometimes that, you know, if you can skip that, you can move faster. And obviously that's, uh, you know, for public entities, it helps with, uh, you know, um, obviously like taxpayers, the ability to move faster, same thing with fleets, the ability to move quicker, because uh, again, we, we usually say to our, uh, you know, potential um, fleets that we're investing in um, that, you know, it real you need at least six months uh, to, out to really begin uh, to uh, have enough time before that vehicle or those vehicles are delivered uh, in order to make sure everything is ready to go so that you, when you just plug in, they start getting their electrons, right? So, um, so this is actually, you know, um, one of the biggest points of this is you might not need to write an RFP at all. Uh, and because uh, there is just opportunities there where it's not a capital expense, right? So, but obviously, of course, uh, with uh, the RFP process, um, uh, you are the one, you're going to take on more of the responsibility than to outline what it is you think needs to happen. Whereas in a charging of service, you know, a company like Electrata would come in and say, uh, you know, since we're taking on the cost and, and complexity of it, we will walk you through and handle it for you so that we know what it is um, or so that you you get everything that you need. But on the RFP, you're going to have to um, look at uh, your uh, have clearly defined goals, your vendor experience requirements, uh, your use case definition, your budget, the equipment. You guys have probably written a lot of these before. Um, but we're also, you're also going to have to um, ask these people who are bidding, these companies who are bidding about their coordination with utilities, with their installation, their operation and maintenance. Uh, and, um, and you're going to have to have certain criteria, which we'll walk you through here, which we think um, are, these are basically the questions you really need to be asking these providers um, and how you build this out when you, um, when you create an RFP. So let me actually just quickly pause there um, and see if um, there's any questions in the chat right now. If there's not, I'll just kind of keep on going. But um, okay, there's no questions yet, so that's totally uh, totally fine. So um, I just wanted to make sure I just uh, didn't uh, bulldoze over it. Uh, so all right, so you see with the uh, typical um, RFP components. Uh, and again, many of you who have written RFPs are going to, this is not going to come as a surprise to any of you, of course. But you have your, uh, the general uh, information, your organizational goals, the timeline, uh, the contact information, the specification, the, and the scoring criteria, and uh, your expected outcomes and reporting. Those are your typical components when you see uh, EV infrastructure RFPs. And we're going to give you uh, three examples here um, from Hamilton County, Ohio Department of Transportation, and then the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency um, that has have done some RFPs and just we'll see some of those things that they put in there as well. Okay, so here's Hamilton County. It's a you know level two public charger. Let me say this quickly about level two as you maybe look over this slide. Um, when it comes to charging, uh, level the levels of charging, uh, level one is slow. It usually uses a, like a 110 plug, and uh, that's uh, usually very rare. You don't see that. Uh, you don't see that a lot in any kind of um, commercial installations. Level two is uh, usually what you're going to get there is uh, more of a uh, something around a, a six to kilowatt hour up to you know maybe double that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a charge, basically what you think of how you can get your vehicle back to full overnight. Um, and then, but of course, these are a lot of the, uh, public charging you see around, um, you know, very, very, uh, you know, popular areas, you know, Electrata, we've done a lot of them at the zoo. Um, we've done them, you know, near concert venues and sports stadiums and all that kind of thing. 
like that. Again, so somebody, um, they can when they uh, come to that venue, they're going to be there a little while longer. It's a way for them to top off that kind of thing. Level three charging is uh, the most expensive charging, but it's also the fastest charging. These are the chargers that you see along the interstate highways. Uh, often in that they can take a, you know, a, a vehicle from um, 10 to 20% uh, to 80% in about um, you know, 20 to 30 minutes, uh, depending on the vehicle. So, um, so yeah, so th these are, uh, and, 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 but this is what we see here, this level two public charging uh, is Hamilton County put out an RFP. Um, and uh, so what they wanted, uh, and they outlined some of the goals there that they have at this for these level two chargers. Again, it was just a uh, be able to uh, provide charging uh, for people who are, uh, you know, attending these uh, more entertainment uh, venues, uh, you know, for their electric vehicles. This, per, this, you know, level two charging, um, it really, really helps a lot of folks who don't have at home charging too. So this is a really, really important part of the, um, uh, as of electric vehicles get adopted. So, um, they, uh, as you can see there, their specific specification were five years, um, and they had it for, uh, five, uh, facilities. So they were putting in 18 level two charging ports. Usually there's a lot of times there's two ports for one, um, uh, EVSE is what it's called. You, we, you know, call them chargers, but they're, uh, uh, they're, uh, actually designated EVSE electric vehicle service equipment. Um, so uh, they didn't have a certain um, charging company they wanted or vendor, but it had to be networked. Uh, so what was the fee going to be? Um, and then the time, the timeline, the bidder installation. I'll share this. Uh, we'll share this as well with anybody who would like um, these uh, this this deck. Uh, and of course, we have the permission as well to uh, uh, to share this as well. So. The way they weighted it uh, was the completeness of the proposal, which I like, uh, found that great. Um, and so, and they also wanted to see uh, how, the ability to deliver at low or no cost to the county, which again, um, you know, they understood some of that charging as a service model. Um, and they also weighted some of the value add brought by the bidder. And, um, and then of course, if they were able uh, to and how they were able to get their um, proposed specifications on time. And here you see um, a few of these um, that have gone into these venues, kind of where they look in these parking garages uh, and whatnot. Um, example two is uh, one probably some of you are familiar with too, is uh, these level two charging uh, near uh, with a partnership with the Department of Trans Ohio Department of Transportation and the Department of Natural Resources uh, to put in uh, level two charging at, um, at uh, different ODOT and ODNR uh, facilities. And this was actually going to be 70 uh, ports uh, there. So um, again, you see, um, you see some of their organizational goals and objectives there. Um, and uh, again, these uh, chargers, these EVSC, there are really, really helpful for EV drivers, especially as they're going out to some of these places that are uh, obviously farther away from interstates. They're going to be, you know, you know, parks and you know that kind of thing, um, and you know, particularly where there's uh, you know overnight camping, overnight accommodation. So these are uh, these are really, really uh, great, um, you know, great options for EV owners. So um, you can look through there these again, but they're uh, all the all kinds of locations, 20 diff, 26 different public locations that they uh, that they identified. And um, again, um, this was uh, expected to be done in two years. And you look and you guys can read through there as that goes. So I'm not going to read through every chart, but you'll see again the weight that they put on that um, stuff. Right? Who can um, who can bring this in the time it has, and their maintenance plan, um, their uh, the how it's organized, um, you know the responsiveness, and then um, the financials and experience. And you'll see some of these here, um, some Houston Woods locations and others. Um, again, some of these um, parks. And here's one from Minnesota. 
um, a level two EV charging uh, one. So this was outside, you know, uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't respond about this. We didn't know about this, but it was, uh, 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 you know, just a, another way, another um, agency, state agency uh, put out the RFP. And so, um, so you can kind of look through some of the things here, but this is one of the one of the areas they put down, of course, is the larger goal to uh, reduce emissions and begin uh, making a dent in that by providing the electric fuel uh, charging. So uh, you can see there because of that goal then that they uh, wanted to see uh, the renewable energy there. Again, that's where that energy management comes in is, is you know, how can you measure and show um, um, you know, based on, you know, what the infrastructure can tell you uh, and what the data you can get from it um, and how that uh, can be uh, translated into uh, some uh, meeting some of those sustainable goals. And you'll see their weighting and criteria there uh, down below, which are all, you know, really good. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, we are, um, constantly beating the drum for is that when you know these RFPs are written you just um, I think one of the, mis the main mistakes that can happen is um, when there are funds available it's it, and it's easy to think um, okay how do I get those funds and then how do we just get uh, some chargers in the ground and we don't actually take a long-term view um, and this is really what's really, really important when you think if you have to write an RFP is thinking um, 10 years out about how are these chargers still going to be in operation? How uh, are they going to get maintained? If they break, how are they going to fix? There's going to be some innovation when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, EVSE charging equipment. And so, uh, you know, are those going to get uh, substantially updated uh, there as well? Who's going to do it? Who's going to pay for it? Maybe some of you have been, uh, if you're an EV owner, uh, you definitely know some of the pain of driving and pulling up to a, a charger and it being broken. And then, of course, if, if these chargers, you know, that have been broken for a long time, um, they just kind of become, you know, eyesores and, and it really, and, you know, and again, if people can't um, rely on the chargers that are in the city or the fleet particularly can't rely on the chargers, then um, obviously, uh, electric vehicle adoption is going to be a lot, lot tougher, and it's it's just going to be harder on everybody. Um, so, really, um, we're always you're constantly beating the drum of saying, uh, be thinking about um, how the this uh, RFP and the response, and then who ultimately does it, um, how they're going to make sure that these chargers. Are uh, are working, um, and not only just working, but you know they're they're a vital part of you know this a growing adoption uh, there as well, and that, that that there's a plan for that. So you know one of the things that um, you know Electrata we make sure to provide when we uh, you know uh, put out, we respond to RFPs is that um, we have a, uh, a 99% uptime guarantee. So the, that so we basically are, are just saying that you know backed by the service level agreement that uh, our chargers will work and uh, and so and then we um, we evaluate the charging companies the the folks who are making these EVSE or evaluating on that whether they can guarantee these uptimes uh, for us as well that's a really important part of uh, of building out. Um, uh, and obviously, when you think about uh, when some of the dollars start to flow uh, to your city or fleet, um, and uh, uh, what you got to really consider. Um, the last one here is just a, a charging as a service. Uh, Northern Kentucky University here, um, you know, uh, this is the one that Electrata did, and um, and so they basically. Uh, had, could bypass um, the RFP um, process. Obviously, there was still an evaluation process, but it just didn't have to go out to RFP because it was. It had. If you look down there, what was important to that is the the zero capital cost of the university. So Electrata, um, again, as a charging as a service company, 
we invested in it. Um, we project managed it. We, uh, we worked with the utilities. We did everything. And again, the EV drivers went at NKU um, just um, plugged in. So we delivered uh, two level two EV charging stations uh, in time for a residence hall uh, in fall of uh, 2021. And again, um, uh, you know, this is a, uh, you know, fee per charge. Um, and, um, you know, we were able to model that particularly with um, NKU. And so it was great. So, you know, they were able to uh, quickly move um, because of this being an operational expense and not a capital expense. Uh, and so uh, we're also then moving forward uh, in, with installations of others there as well. So, um, Here's a, you know, again, here's a slide uh, just about some of the things about collaboration um, and then obviously uh, teaming up for technical assistance. Um, and, uh, and obviously uh, one of the things that you should expect as well is, um, you know, when you're talking about the money, right? You know, uh, you, even a, a company like Electrata for charging as a service, we're gonna make sure that, um, that uh, you know, we are able to get you all the, uh, you know, the funding and the grants and things that are available to you um, as well. Um, so, um, but also you, you need, you're going to want to ask that of, of any organization as well about their knowledge and ability to, um, you know, help offset um, the cost of the construction and the chargers. All right. So uh, that is all for me. I feel talked out anyway. So, um, so I would love to hear what some questions came up for you as I was uh, presenting. And, uh, and again, if we, um, if Ned or I don't know the answer, we'll just say, I don't know, and we'll find the answer for you uh, uh, as well. But uh, again, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to, to come in here and to, uh, to do this. And uh, so, yeah, so I'd love to hear what questions arose for you as, uh, as you were listening. All right, thank you, Larissa. Uh, I'll read this out loud. Does Electrata typically still respond to RFPs written by fleet customers who haven't contemplated CAS? If so, can you offer both CAS, where Electrata owns and operates, and turnkey install O&M, but where the customer retains ownership? Uh, that is a really, really good question. Uh, so yes, we still, uh, we, we typically respond to RFPs written by fleet customers uh, and largely um, because it is such a, a new industry that they might not even be aware that a company like ours uh, even exists to do um, what it is they wanna do. Or of course, um, you know, um, you know, and, and part of even some responding to some of this is, you know, obviously maybe in the RFI stage, uh, you know, right where they're actually just seeking some of the, the information there as well. So we try to help them understand, um, uh, yeah, that model. So we, we do definitely respond to RFPs for sure. Um, so, um, so we don't, uh, we don't offer a model where we don't retain ownership um, because uh, since we are taking on the risk you know, by obviously investing in all of uh, the things that need to happen to power your electric vehicles, um, that it's really uh, important um, you know, for us that we have uh, full and total uh, uh, control um, of that investment. Um, and we do that, of course, for your benefit. Uh, it's not... Um, you know, it, it makes it easy uh, for us to swap out chargers when they break or swap out chargers when they need to be upgraded when a better one comes, you know, that kind of help. It helps us, obviously. Uh, and since we're also delivering that fixed cost of power to you, um, it also, uh, that's one of the things that's um, by us retaining ownership that makes sure that we are able to um, to uh, deliver you that fixed price of power. So, um, so yeah, um, you know, just like, I guess if you, if you happen to host your website on AWS, um, you probably don't own any of the servers or, or anything like that, uh, with, um, that they use to, to power your website. Um, and they can kind of swap it out as needed and what's best, you know, best for you. That's the same um, with us, so. 
right? Okay, Alex, thanks. What happens to the chargers if the site hoax decides to stop service? So um, actually, Ned, do you wanna talk to this one? Because we, we have not had anybody decide to stop service, but um, obviously uh, you'll see it in every city, right? Where, um, uh, where uh, there is a dead charger. I actually just bought um, my first EV. I bought a Ford Mustang Mach-E back in February. It was super fun, and I um, drove to Indianapolis, and they had a, they had a lot of good chargers, but I just happened to find one that had been dead and been dead for a couple of years, and um, um, so and it would just it, it was obviously just still there. So Ned, Ned, do you want to uh, say to this about? Sure. Um, so thinking about this in the context of if a site host decides to stop service, I'm assuming this is meaning like if they decide um, not to continue electrifying, they find out it's not working for them for whatever reason. This is something that we would want to avoid naturally. We would be doing due diligence with a host to make sure that they're planning on electrifying since our business model is to invest in the infrastructure up front and um, see that those are going to be used. So uh, sometimes we'll have, um, you know, a clause in their agreement with the host that they're going to um, use the station since that's how we make our investment back. Uh, and that uh, if the host for whatever reason decided, you know what, we're not going to proceed with electrification, um, then there would be some sort of minimum offtake uh, agreement there. Um, but we have not actually seen that happen and we uh, don't anticipate that being likely that once an organization commits to uh, electrifying and starts to proceed with it, that uh, maybe plans for growth might change in the future, uh, but that whatever vehicles uh, they acquired to electrify um, would stay in their fleet um, and you would see at least that level of use. Uh, but that's definitely a situation we want to avoid. We don't want to be taking charges out of the ground and we're not uh, anticipating the need to do that. Um, not sure if that answers the question, but yeah, that's great. Uh, it'd be yeah. a, a rare and hopefully avoidable situation. Okay, cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. great answer. Thanks. Cool. And you want to scoot over just a touch there? Yep. Thank you. I hope you're out of the screen. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. Still here. So let's keep let's keep Ned here. So uh, all right. Is there anything else? Any other questions? You know, one of the things we get asked a lot to uh, is um, you know, if um, you don't own your own depot, like you don't own the parking lot, you're leasing the parking lot from a landlord, um, you know, um, what is a company? And that's obviously one going to be one of considerations, um, you know, for you. So that that can be one of the um, advantages of a charging as a service, right? And uh, so we would work with the, um, uh, the landlord to make sure that you, uh, obviously, while you're there, that you have the uh, um, all the infrastructure you need to power your vehicles. But then also, that's going to be a, quite an improvement for uh, the landlord. And then, of course, when you move, our our agreement still stands. Uh, if you uh, if you need to go somewhere new, you need obviously to power uh, your electric vehicle. So uh, you know our agreement is still going to stand, um, and uh, to get you the infrastructure uh, you need. Versus again, if you do it yourself, own and operate, um, that's going to be a particular uh, a particular uh, a barrier that you'll have to um, you know plan for. So, just wanted to add that. Okay, cool. Uh, if there's anything else, I'll let the uh, the awkward silence <laughs> sit for there. But yeah, that's good. Well, again, well, thank you guys again. This was really. Really great privilege to get there and do this with you all. And uh, I'll give it back to Rachel uh, if uh, you guys, um, just to close it out. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, this webinar has been recorded and it will be posted on Clean Fields Ohio's YouTube channel. And I'll also send a follow-up email um, to everyone who registered for the webinar with that link once the recording is posted. But like David said, um, if any questions come up you know, down the line, feel free to reach out to us at CFO or, or to Electrata. Um, and I'm sure that any of us would be happy to answer or point you in the right direction where you can find that answer. So thanks everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye guys. Thank you all.